All right, I think we might get going. Just want to say good evening, everyone. Welcome to Koalas in the Northern Tablelands. Uh, firstly, before anything else, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we're all calling in from. So I'm on Anawan land and I pay my respects to elders past and present and to any First Nations people on the webinar today. My name is Elsie Baker and I'm a project officer with Northern Tablelands Local Land Services based in Armidale. And before we get going with the webinar, just a little bit of housekeeping. We'll have two presentations and then we'll have 20 minutes of questions. And you'll see that there's a control panel in the top right hand corner of your screen. And you'll see that there is a little red arrow to the left of that, which collapses and reinstates the control panel. Um, as we're talking, please type any questions you have into that control panel. There's a little area where you can type questions in. They will go directly to us, no one else can see them. And then I'll relay them to our panelists later on. So I should also say that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Um, and also that the, this webinar is being recorded and it will be distributed via email tomorrow. So I'd like to introduce you to our two panelists, Rahman and Des. Des Anderson is from Southern New England Landcare and he is undertaking an awesome koala project in the Armadale area and he'll talk to you about that in his presentation. Our organisations, Local Land Services and Southern New England Landcare work in partnership with each other. And he's calling in from Anawan Lands as well. Roman Christescu is from the University of Sunshine Coast and she has been working with us over the last four years conducting research around the Northern Tablelands. And she's calling in from Cubby Cubby Country. Over to you, Roman. Thank you, Elsie. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So I will start my talk. That's it. Um, so, yeah, my name is Dr. Roman Christescu, and um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodian on the land on which I speak tonight, the Kabi Kabi people, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I also want to um, acknowledge and thank uh, all the people that have been collecting that data over the last few years. Uh, some of them are here in those pictures. So an overview of the talk tonight. I'm gonna, not that I need to, but I thought I'll throw it in anyway. Um, why do we care? What do you wanna study, Koala? What do we collect data? And it's been a few years now that we do. And um, if you haven't been convinced yet, I will give you a few reasons of why Koala are so cool. And that um, transfer then us to the Cool Country Koala Project. And that has been um, led um, by the Northern Tableland Local Land Services uh, over the last few years. And then I'll finish by um, a few ideas of how you yourself can contribute um, to protecting koala in the Northern Tablelands. All right, why survey koala? So there's a million of reasons, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to give you a few examples of reason one, because they're great. Two, they're very special as a species. And three, and unfortunately, I think all of us um, here know that they are vulnerable. So koala are great, and um, they're just a fantastic species. And I think um, when you study them, it's very lucky. You keep learning more and more funny facts about them. So I'll share a few of my favorites. It was proven a few years ago that koala males are big liars. Basically, um, if you have ever heard the uh, sound of a koala bellow, um, it's very loud. And um, normally in the animals, uh, animal kingdom, the bigger the animal, the bigger the bellow. And so if koala were in lying, they should be the size of a buffalo. So obviously they're a much smaller animal and they've got a special um, you know, apparatus and that makes them able to create such big loud sound. Baby koala eat their mom's poop. Very uh, little no fact, maybe, um, not the most pleasant, but so important. Um, it's not any kind of poo, though, it's a special poo. It's a bit more uh, liquid and it comes straight out of the second, and it's called the pap. And the pap is critical to survival of baby koala because it contains a lot of um, microbiome, the bacteria, and all those uh, helpers um, that are uh, critical to digest very tough eucalyptus leaves. 
So koala are often called koala bears, but they're absolutely not related to bears at all. You probably know that. Maybe you didn't know that. Their closest relative, their cousin, are the wombats. Interestingly, like us, koala have individual fingerprints. So if a koala ever was to commit a crime, we could kind of identify that koala, um, just as we do with humans. And also their nose pattern is unique. So that's a nice picture here of the little pink pattern on the uh, black nose of this koala. And that um, koala is gonna keep that pattern for its life. So that's also a way to recognize them. So a few more koala, less funny, but interesting to know. I thought um, I'll go through them quickly. They're very fussy eater. That might be um, quite well known in any uh, specific um, area. They only eat a handful of um, species of trees and they sleep a lot, um, probably about 18 hours a day. They can live any, anything between 10 and 18 years uh, in the wild. And their home range is very viable. So it's very hard for scientists to say this is how much habitat or area a koala will use uh, during its life because it really depends where this koala live. And it can be as small as two hectares and as large as 300 hectares. The females start breeding at about two years old, and then um, they usually will produce one joey every year, um, might not survive, but they're very um, consistent. And the joey, um, like um, you know, all the marsupials are born very small and uh, very early on, only after 35 days of gestation. They stay hidden in the pouch, so you can see the pouch bulging more and more, and then after six months, they probably reach their peak cuteness, although it's debated because they're quite cute for a long time. Uh, but yeah, they can start riding on the on the back of the of their mom for another six months until the new one is born. So those were my funny facts, but koala are also very special as an animal. So first, in terms of evolutionary um, tree, if you want, if you look at where the koala sits, um, it sits very much on its own. A lot of the other species and including other species of koala have now become extinct. So as I was saying, wombat is the closest relative, but still, you know, it's it's not that close as far as relatives go. So, you know, they represent a very special step of the evolution and, and no one else can replace where they, where they stand in the evolutionary tree. They're also special and specialized. So that I call that the koala conundrum and that's something that really fascinates me. Um, as I said, they have a very tough diet. That's why they need all those bacteria to help digest them. So it's a very low nutrient diet for a start. And so often when you survive on a low nutrient diet, you need large quantity of food. Think about a cow. But the issue with koala is obviously they live in trees, so they cannot be as big as a cow, otherwise the tree would uh, collapse. So they are limited by that arbor arboreal life uh, in size, which limits their gut size as well. So to start, you know, that's really putting them on the edge, right? Because they should be eating a lot more, but they can't because they can't be that much bigger, they can't fit much more guts in their stomach. The second thing is the diet they're surviving on is very highly toxic. And so they cannot eat too much of it because they need to give time to their bacteria to actually detoxify all that um, nasty chemical um, uh, soup. And so because of both low nutrient and high toxicity, toxicity that means they cannot really um, create fat reserves. So they kind of need to um, eat every day. And with their you know, gut size constraint, that also means they cannot put fat away. Um, it's just all of that kind of interacts and combines to make um, them really living on the edge. And so if anything happens, like um, the koala are quite vulnerable to that, they really need, for instance, to have access to food every day. So that's quite um, special and, and particular to them. Unfortunately, that's not so particular to koala. Like many other wildlife in Australia, and koala have been experiencing um, a lot of decline. That's uh, the decline over all their range and um, in all the population they've been studied and have now been classified vulnerable um, across New South Wales, Queensland and ACT. However, this is under review uh, following the fires um, in 2019-2020 and um, probably within a few weeks they will be um, classified as endangered. And the threat they're facing are quite well known. There's there's um, well-studied reason that the koala have been declining. The first one probably still 
um, would be habitat loss, modification and fragmentation of koala habitats. Um, another important one is disease, uh, which is unfortunate, but the chlamydial disease is really um, pushing some population um, in sharp declines. Vehicle strike and dog attack are linked, um, of course, to um, human presence and are also problematic. And then um, in some part of their range, we've seen some eucalyptus die back. And finally, of course, as we talk, bushfire and all the threat really related to climate change. So that includes um, heat wave and drought, for instance. All right, so those are all the reasons why um, the Cool Country Cola project started in 2016 and involved uh, a lot of uh, partners. And it was really on the back of um, the LLS putting out the Northern Table and Cola Recovery Strategy. And in that strategy um, are you know, many important goals, but we really fit in that improvement of baseline koala data. And so the action that were um, you know, promoted in the strategy were to undertake survey in some area of priority. I will talk about that. And then establish survey protocol and enable and increase public reporting of sighting. This is something that's going to come back over and over again in this talk, is the importance of each and every one of us uh, to report any koala they see. Now, obviously, you know, there's um, government and there's research and we are there out there collecting data, but um, we can never be as many as, um, you know, everyone that's got a, a property, basically. And um, so there's, there's um, really strengths in, in putting effort together and all reporting where, where we see koala. And that really is uh, well used and you'll see that. So this is an example of how that data is used. So when before we started the survey, all that was known was where sighting had been reported in the past. So experts came and had a look at those sightings. Those are the dots on the map. And then they tried to create those priority area for survey. Those are area where population of koala were thought to be um, you know, uh, existing based on those um, historical sightings. But we needed to confirm what was the current status. And that's really um, how we targeted the survey we did. So what did we do? So we did some field survey to find koala scats, and that mainly involved um, that big nose that is not a koala nose this time, it's a dog nose. And that's the, the survey uh, method that we use is based on koala scats, which is the first picture. And we use um, detection dogs that are specially trained on those uh, scats. And they are a very quick and accurate way to map where koala live. So not just where koala is today, but those scats are produced many times a day and they stay in the environment for many weeks and months. And so it really tells us all the area that has been used by koala in the, in the recent time. We did some koala uh, flora survey. We also assessed uh, some threats. And I'll go quicker through those points. I'm really gonna show you a lot of, of the map and the places where we've been, but I'll touch on chlamydia. And um, recently we have also looked at uh, genetics in, in some of the stronghold of the Northern Tableland. And this year we are coming back and we're coming back with um, not only uh, detection dogs, but drones. So um, stay, um, stay tuned. So first, the result of our flora survey. And um, I'm not going to read through all that slide, but I just wanted to put it there. In case you know um, those uh, plant community type and you have them on your property or around, those are good spots to go and look for koala because this is where we uh, find them most often um, during our surveys. I'm also not going to read through that complicated list, thank goodness, um, but um, know that we have looked at what trees also are used across um, the Northern Tableland. And so Northern uh, Tableland local land services would have access to um, that data and they can inform you, especially if you want to, for instance, plant trees that are really well used by koala on your property, um, you could get local information. This is where I'm going to spend um, most of my time talking about the data of present substance. Um, the, so all the survey that we've conducted since 2016. So I'm going to go year by year and then pull them all together. So basically, we kind of ranked um, from the area of priority that were the highest priority, so where we really expected uh, to have koala, and then we went down the line. So you will see that we had a lot more presence of koala at the start of the survey then the end, that doesn't mean it's a decline, we just target a different area. 
So the first year ourselves, uh, we went around in Varel and the Longra, and where there was a lot of green dots. All the green dots will be koala positive site, and the uh, red dots will be koala negative site. Um, so all together, about 30%, one in three sites, I had koala presence. And um, we were um, sad to, um, to see that we couldn't find a lot of koala any longer in the Ashford area. In the south, Springy Bark Ecological went and surveyed around Armidale, Walsha and the Wendock, and they found about one every two sites had koala presence, and especially a large population around Armidale. The following year, uh, we focused on um, you know, some other of those priority sites. So those are the orange blob, if you want, that the expert had put on the map, and that thought, um, they thought that's where koala um, were more likely to have um, persisted from the um, historical record. So again, historical record are those little blue dots, and then green is koala presence and red is koala absence. So um, we found about one uh, site in four that had koala presence, and um, really around 10 to feel at that time um, had the most uh, koala detected. All of that still based on cats. So the following year, we went um, and focused around um, Kinga and Bundara, and also between Walsha and Nawendok, a little bit um, trying to fill the gap in between the priority area, and um, we found less presence. And then last year, again, um, quite full presence, but again, because um, a lot of the sites were in places um, where we were less expect, expecting to find koala, but also we had um, a very wet uh, season, and that also in, um, mean that the scat decay a lot quicker. So we can find them for less long if you want. So those uh, absence mean recent absence instead of a few weeks or a few months absence. So putting it all together and start building a map of where, um, if you want, those priority area, those population have persisted and where uh, we can't find them. When you compare to, you know, um, all the record collected in the last um, 70 years, really, um, that shows you, you know, that some, some of the area like Inverell, the Mungra, or Amidel, uh, are really still very, um, very much um, important for koala. And some area are probably new around Tentafield that weren't necessarily on the map before we started the survey. However, some of the area um, like um, Emmaville or Ashford have seen um, potentially declining koalas. So in terms of threats, I'm not going to go through all the threads, but I just wanted to show you that that, are the, that is concerning chlamydia, which is a very um, important threat, and, and the difference you can find across the landscape. Um, the way we got that data was to analyze cats. So, uh, you know, I'm a big fan as an ecologist of scat survey because not only you can map where an animal has been, but you can also um, bring that scat back to the lab and start studying um, the animal genetics, the pathogen and the disease they carry, and the microbiome, so all those bacteria that are present in the scats, and even uh, some hormones as well. So it's very interesting, um, you know, to start adding all the layers. So as we were um, talking about, Inverell and, and Armidale are really koala hotspots. They're really places where there's still uh, a strong koala population. Um, but um, the disease or the presence of the chlamydia pathogen is much higher in Armidale um, than it is in Inverell. And in terms of genetics, um, basically this is where we also collected scats and we extracted the koala DNA. And we ran some program and, and interrogate the data and it told us that Imperial and Armidale should be considered at two separate uh, populations. So there's not a lot um, of uh, genetic um, um, exchange, if you want, between those two areas for the koala. So that was, um, in a nutshell, about I think it's probably five years now of survey. Um, so that's what, what we've been busy doing uh, with LLS and other partners. Um, but I wanted to really finish this talk about what you can be doing, because um, there is a lot we can do, all of us, um, to help koala conservation. And I always say it takes a village uh, to save koala. And I believe, you know, both researcher and government have their role to play. But, um, you know, anyone that... Um, lives in Kuala country also has um, a, an important role to play. So I'm going to walk through those points, engage with uh, your Koala network, help increase Koala knowledge, report Koala, that will become familiar now at this stage of the talk, 
protect and restore koala habitat and try to decrease the threat that koala are facing. So in terms of network, um, NTLLS has produced um, a Facebook page that um, I, I encourage you to join, the Northern Table and Threatened Species Network, and it's obviously broader than the koala, but there's a lot of uh, very interesting uh, information being shared. You can um, report your sighting, let your community you know, get people excited that koala are just there in your backyard, post your pictures, it's always really nice to see what they look like. Um, and you can obviously be kept in the loop, so find information, extend knowledge, and you know events such as tonight will be uh, addressed, advertised through the search network. So yeah, get in touch with the people that are also interested and in, in pull um, forces. So one thing that you can do with and um, encourage your family and friend to do um, is to report koala and koala signs. So that's um, you know, that's really basic information that um, when nothing else exists, that's always um, where we go to um, and when where government goes to to understand where um, they koala live. So it's really critical to gather that information and you can value add a lot. So I'm going to um, walk you through a few things that you can check when you have found a koala and that really um, makes your data a much richer and more important uh, data set. So is it a male or a female koala? So there are signs that you can look for. Males are generally bigger, although when they're high in a tree, that's really hard to assess the size of a koala. So all the things that I look for are, um, males are generally what I call dirtier. Really, it's the fact that they um, in front of their um, chest is a gland that produces a, a smelly liquid that they probably use to communicate with other males. And that kind of becomes brown and painted. Um, especially as the koala male age, whereas female always have a very white, thin uh, front. Male have a bigger nose, they call that a Roman nose, I think, and um, female are a bit more pointy, and that makes female generally a little bit cuter. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I don't want any um, male to be offended. I, I have a bit, um, you know, male are, are lying and they're dirtier, and, they're not as cute as female, it's only for koala, don't take it personally. Um, but so that's the thing that I look for, um, to look for male, female. Of course, if there's a joy on the back, it's also a female. Um, now this, this uh, part of the talk is very important because chlamydia is a major threat um, to the koala and is easily recognizable um, in, the, in the wild. And if everyone is um, aware of the sign, you can really help koala um, because Chlamydia or disease is treatable, but only if we pick it up early enough. So that becomes really uh, critical, you know, in terms of management to have as many eyes out there looking for signs of, of sickness. And we describe them as pink eyes. So that's um, because the eye become very infected and, and create a lot of soft tissue and dirty bottom. And that comes from urinary tract infection. So this is how it looks like when it's really bad in those both picture. Um, but especially the I1 ocular disease is, is having good sign of success. Um, urinary tract disease, when it's very late, it's hard to uh, treat, but um, it's also very painful. So you really need to get in touch with wildlife rescue group at this stage. And usually healthy koala do not let us touch them. So they are quite curious as an animal. So it's not a 100% uh, rule, but if you find a koala prostrate at the bottom of the tree, for a long period of time, that koala is really struggling and it needs to be uh, taken to a vet as quickly as possible. Don't pick them up yourself though, call the wildlife rescue groups. All right, another thing that you can do, and especially if you are lucky enough that you have koala visiting your property, is start recognizing them and you can name them. <laughs> and then you keep a little book uh, or, or on your computer and you put all your picture and you look at for uh, the sign, um, you know, of, um, of the pattern, the, the pink area of the nose. And um, those are six different individuals in one of my research projects, and I think they really look all so different. Know your scats. So that's my little, obviously, um, little love, because I do think there's so much you can tell just from scats. You don't need to just wait for seeing the koala. It's very special, but it can be quite rare. So look at your feet, walk around, and um, and search for those koala scats that can stay in, in the environment for longer so it can tell you whether your property is koala habitat. So they're quite symmetrical and bullet shaped. They're not jelly bean shaped. I will show you some um, that are jelly bean. They are usually larger at one end and skinnier at the other end. They're about a centimeter and a half 
um, lengths for an adult koala, and they're hard to break. They're very dense. Koala are excellent at chewing their food. Uh, so they're kind of like a food processor. But be careful because there are uh, some that are going to trick you. Um, those are all possum scats, and some of them are easier uh, to recognize as possum scat. The jelly bean one or the, the fat one don't look very koala y, but sometimes they can trick you. Um, those scats are possum, but if you break them, they probably smell less eucalyptus, less nice than koala scats, and there's also, they're also less dense. And sometimes if they have insect bits, then they're definitely uh, possum and not koala. So now that you have all that wealth of information with you uh, about your sighting and the health and the sex of the koala um, and all those things, report it. And you can either report it on your computer or you can also download apps on your phone um, like Ozatas app or iSpy Koala. And that allows you to do it on, on the run when you are out there and you can you know, give the coordinate and do everything automatically. So easy, right, to download all those apps and learn how to use them. So if you're not comfortable with those apps, uh, if you have, um, you know, uh, need a little bit of help, then um, luckily LC and DES are really happy to take your call. They can walk you through it, but they can also record your sighting. Every sighting counts, so don't, don't let uh, technology stop you. All right, protect terrestrial habitat is a very critical thing um, that also needs to happen for the koala. As I was saying before, it's the main threat currently. So protect tree if you have some around your farm and plant more tree. There's lots of benefit associated with planting tree. And if you don't yourself have a property where you can do that, um, you know, join or help land care. Um, they're often really strategic corridor uh, planting program that you can support. So um, they're fun activity um, and on top of helping koala and all the other animals. And finally, last thing you can do yourself is try to decrease the other threats that koala are facing. Restrain your dog, and that's practically at night when koala are on the move. Drive carefully, especially dusk and dawn, and report any sick and injured koala to wildlife rescue group because sometimes um, you know, we can still save them and this will talk to you more about that. Finally, um, you can put out water when there's heat wave. And um, recently, the University of Sydney has developed a blinky drinker, and you can install them on your property so that koala ho always have access uh, to water. They don't necessarily, um, you know, are, are known to drink a lot, but they do drink a lot, um, especially, um, you know, when it's very hot. But however, if you find a koala, I just wanted to say, um, because that's a problem that is often uh, found by wildlife risk group, do not give them uh, water from a water bowl. Put a bowl out, because otherwise that might go in their lung and, and cause trouble. And that's it for me. Um, I just wanted to share that you can um, follow that uh, Northern Table and Threatening Species Network on Facebook, and as well as, as our group, if you want to keep in touch. Uh, thank you very much, and I think we will answer question at the end of this uh, talk. Um, thanks, Roman. I'm, I'm hoping um, everybody can hear me now and uh, you can see my screen. Um, yeah. because I to hear a lot from this end. Um, firstly, thank you um, to the Northern Tablelands Local Land Services for hosting this today. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the Anawan people as the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, what I'm going to talk about today has a lot of connection to Rahman's um, presentation and there will be some overlap. Um, but that really emphasises what the project is about. Um, we are a koala partnership project um, through Landcare that um, really relies on um, building partnerships with both uh, industry organisations and most importantly the community um, to try and, and get some koala conservation actions uh, underway and embedded in, in people's um, thinking. Um, pretty much over the next 10 years, uh, while we still have a chance to ensure those populations. 
the background to our particular project at Landcare uh, was born out of the 2018 New South Wales Koala Strategy. Um, that was responsible for hosting a number of regional conservation koala teams which were based uh, on the North Coast, the Mid-North Coast and the Southern Highlands. The Landcare hosted uh, regional partnership came about in 2020. So we've had a year to get it underway and to start to build some of those partnerships which are, are critical to the uh, success of the project. The aim is uh, to reflect uh, the former Minister for the Environment, uh, Matt Keane's words, um, to ensure the survival of the koala in the wild for the next 100 years. Um, to support that, we're looking at particular activities which form the four key pillars of the strategy. And they are to uh, ensure that koala habitat is conserved and to uh, develop further habitat. Um, to, con to do that through community action, so whether it's private or public lands, um, to ensure that there is uh, conservation land for koalas, to ensure that the sa uh, safety and health of koalas is uh, ongoing and, and embedded in, in people's minds, which uh, remain uh, touched on a little bit there. Um, and most importantly, to keep building our knowledge on how those populations interact and survive. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, there's a little bit of a, an example of the uh, cyclical nature of the project, which is to firstly raise awareness, um, to seek assistance through existing knowledge and to build on that. Uh, importantly, to foster involvement right across the community and to build partnerships within that involvement. Southern New England Landcare uh, are hosting the Northern Tablelands Koala Partnership um, within the region that pretty much surrounds Armadale within a 40k radius. So at this stage, we're focused on the area that uh, extends to Guyra in the north, uh, Kentucky uh, south of Urala, Wollamombe in the east, and Kingstown in the west. Something to notice with this map. Uh, is the purple shaded area, which has got my cursor around it um, at the moment. Uh, that area outlined is known as a koala area of regional significance. Um, as Romaine highlighted in, in her speech, it's um, where most of the koala populations have been identified. Um, it's not exclusive to what might go on in areas that uh, aren't within that uh, polygon, but uh, that does form an area where we know there are viable populations of, of koalas at present. Um, and what is particular to this project is not just what's happening within that shaded area, but how to connect um, habitat and koala conservation in the areas that link the Eastern Fall Country, where the national parks uh, are bounded, and also the vegetation corridors that uh, extend up towards the northwest through Bandara, Tinga, um, and ultimately through Inverell up towards the border. So why are we here and why are we, why are we looking at um, the importance of koala conservation? The Studies that uh, have come out of, of uh, recent data indicate that the Northern Tablelands contains about five to 10% of the New South Wales koala population. Um, while that figure is low when compared to the overall population, it does indicate that there is a viable population of koalas on the Northern Tablelands. And more importantly, that the Northern Tablelands is potentially a koala refuge area. Uh, which means that under uh, development pressures in coastal areas and climate change towards the west, that the Northern Tablelands really stands out as one of the areas that may be uh, a suitable koala refuge um, when impacts start to accumulate. The direct threats that, um, again, Raman touched on, 
particularly habitat loss uh, in coastal regions and habitat degradation, um, disease including chlamydia, um, vehicle strikes, dogs and livestock um, is, is one that not many people know at this stage, um, but particularly on, on rural lands, uh, cattle have been known in particular um, to sometimes potentially kill koalas, but um, uh, injure koalas when they share similar um, water bodies. And lastly, weed and pest management is also critical um, because koalas can find it difficult to move through areas that are, are weed infested, um, but also the, um, the impact of weeds on habitat areas um, can reduce the, um, the health of the tree and the attractiveness of that tree uh, as a feed tree for koalas. To overarch these problems, we've got insidious threats such as climate change and natural disasters. Uh, which many people would know um, back in 2019. We had uh, a particular natural disaster with climate change and drought, which um, really impacted uh, koalas, which I'll discuss in a minute. But um, firstly, I think it's important to remember why we're here and why we want to protect these little guys. Um, not only are they our national emblem and identity, um, but they're recognised overseas as, um, as being something that's unique to Australia and therefore that gives us a responsibility um, to care for the koala populations and on a broader level our environment. I've got a picture on the left of uh, an example of habitat planting on someone's property. Over the last 30 years or so these plantings have become critical in, in um, connecting koala corridors between the coast and tablelands and ensuring that they have um, protected corridors to move between areas where they might find suitable feed trees. It's important to remember that for every gap in those connected vegetation corridors, um, the threat to koalas through predation or um, vehicle strike um, is, is magnified. Um, so that um, really emphasises the, the importance of, of having landholders and, and community uh, in general involved in, in helping with habitat conservation. Lastly, we are now in an age where, as uh, Ramon again indicated, we're, we're looking at the koala status from moving to um, endangered from the current level of vulnerable and it's foreseeable that without action, we may be in a situation where koalas are confined to zoos and uh, that would be a situation for our next generation that would be difficult to explain. I've got a little quote underneath from uh, the former Mayor of Urala, Michael Pearce, who was kind enough to do an interview through this project last year. He's um, from his position um, out towards in McGarry on a bushland block, I think he coined a, a really accurate phrase in saying that most people appreciate their role in keeping wildlife safe and he's one of the many people that I think would like to do something as long as they can see or, or understand where uh, those, those opportunities to, to be involved uh, might lie. As I said earlier, the, the impact of the natural disasters in 2019 and 2020 was uh, significant for our existing koala population. Um, there have been estimates that um, indicate that we may have lost up to a third of the uh, existing population. And aside from that, the amount of habitat that was lost through the bushfires equates to about one quarter in New South Wales uh, to what was there previous to the bushfires. Um, one of the sad facts to come out of that uh, natural disaster was the increase in temperatures and the incidence of fire was something that was um, not experienced before, uh, unprecedented on, on New South Wales and Australian terms. And, um, 
with science pointing towards that becoming the norm, it uh, indicates that there is uh, a very acute need to, to ensure that um, some of these survival strategies for koalas are undertaken by the community. I'd like to talk briefly about uh, one of the areas that we're looking at as part of the, the project. Um, again, Roman has provided a little bit of um, data on koala surveys. The triangles that uh, you can see on the map that are popping up in, in blue and orange are koala sightings that are reported uh, through those reporting platforms by the community. And one thing that becomes apparent when you're looking at this uh, map is the incidence of koala sightings in around the Armidale region. And uh, it's not to be confused with the fact that there are a lot of koalas in Armidale. It um, indicates that uh, more likely there are a lot of people in Armidale to report those sightings. Um, and if you extrapolate or extend that information, you get a fair idea that there are probably viable populations that are going unreported in areas that aren't close to um, urban areas. So again, as uh, Roman was, um, was saying in, in her uh, presentation, this data is critical to, to feed up to the New South Wales government to provide actions uh, back to the community and funding on how we can help uh, the survival of the koalas. Without these sightings, we would have limited ideas through survey work on, on where koalas exist. Um, and sightings are, are a large part of, of um, the, the, the data set to indicate where the populations are. So a couple of ideas on what landholders or um, the, the community in general might like to, to assist. Um, firstly, restoring koala habitat on your property is critical. Um, there are over 40 eucalypt species in our local area um, in the southern New England that contribute as koala feed trees. And land care in the northern New South Wales, local land services are always happy to provide opportunities to get landholders involved in recreating, whether they're corridors or block plantings, um, areas of habitat that, that might be conserved and contribute towards uh, koala habitat or feed areas. The reason we, we do that is to recreate the natural landscapes. So we're looking at, at tree species that are endemic or absolutely native to the area and also may provide um, wider biodiversity benefits to the property owner. We have hosted previous uh, webinars that some people might be aware of that um, give you the, the tools or the nuts and bolts to be able to do that. And both organisations, the Northern Tablelands Local Land Service and Landcare, are happy to work with people to um, provide the, the, the resources and tools and knowledge on how you might go about uh, planting on your property. If you need any ideas or you'd like to talk to us about that, and there's also guidelines under the New South Wales Koala Revegetation Plan. So what we do as part of the EOI or Expression of Interest process is come out and visit your property when we receive an EOI. Um, we look at opportunities for joint enterprise planning. If there's blocks of neighbours that um, really does have merit towards a project in establishing uh, wider connected corridors, and we can provide knowledge packs um, that give you uh, part of the tools and the instruments to um, undertake a, a wider scale effective planting. In general, some ideas on, on getting involved. Um, have a look at both our website at Southern New England Landcare and the Northern Tablelands Local Land Services. There is always plenty of events and community engagement activities um, that will be able to provide um, knowledge and, um, and resources for people that want to be involved. 
As Roman said, if you're aware of those key threatening processes, your vehicle strikes, um, your backyard fencing, um, the threat from livestock and the threat from dogs, we can help you uh, work on strategies to reduce those threats. If you're in a position where you see a koala and you'd like to report it, there's a number of platforms you can use. One is the I Spy Koala app that feeds up to the statewide Bionet program. Um, and there are others available through the Australian Living Atlas that was mentioned previously. The Armadale Regional Council has all been, also been recording koala sightings over the last five years. And from last count, I think they had somewhere in the order of over 500 koalas reported for the Armadale local government area. So that's a, a positive indication that we um, are consistently having koalas either moving through the area or resident populations within the area. And most importantly, if you see a koala and it looks like it's in distress, uh, either from humans, dogs or vehicles, there are two agencies that uh, have the resources to, to help and the numbers are, are below. That's Northern Tablelands Wildlife Carers and WIRES on the general number. For private land conservation, there's always funding available to fence and plant koala habitat on your property. So if you, if you want to be a part of that, um, get in contact with Southern New England Land Care or the Northern Tablelands Local Land Services and um, submit a, an expression of interest and we're happy to work with you on that going forward. And some of our local native tree nurseries can also help with koala friendly, friendly trees. Um, it's, it doesn't matter what scale you're interested in, if you want to plant, uh, you have a small block and you'd like to establish uh, 20 or 40 uh, habitat trees on your block, it all counts. If you're looking at larger projects that might extend to one or 2,000 trees, if you contact these nurseries, they, they have stock available at the moment and uh, we can help you with one of those projects. Um, I think it's also important to remember that um, when we talk about koala habitat, we're not limiting that habitat to eucalypt species. We're also talking about the um, understory or the, the shrubs as well that go towards uh, protecting uh, koalas and uh, keep, keeping them safe. And there's a, a number below if you'd like to contact us um, or contact the Northern, Lab, uh, Northern Tablelands Local Land Services. We'd love to hear from you. And I think that's it. Awesome. Thank nice work. Everybody. Thank you, Roman and Des. That was really awesome. Now we've got quite a few questions. Um, so we might not get to all of them, but um, should we not answer your question, we'll, we'll um, look at it afterwards and contact you directly. Um, so first up, I wanted to ask, um, I want to say that's those are really good in terms of the planting of the trees. I actually know someone who planted trees not long ago and they already, the, the trees are still really young and they've already seen koalas on their property. So um, yep. I think they only planted it four years ago. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so first question I've got for Raman, which is, um, I've got narrated a question asking about uh, the recruitment of young koalas. This actually could be both of for you um, as well. Um, uh, can you please make some comments about what is happening with the recruitment of young koalas in the Northern Tablelands? How are we seeing young koalas surviving into adulthood? Well, there's, you'll probably have access to more population um, monitoring data than I do. Yeah, look, um, that's, again, that's, um, it, it's an area that has got very initial research into, I guess. Um, I, I'm, I'm figuring, uh, taking that question to mean how viable those populations are. Um, I guess that the data is showing at the moment that the Northern Tablelands, while it does have a small population of, of koalas compared to coastal areas, the population does appear to be stable at the moment. Um, there is a question whether they are transient koalas that we're having a look at 
or they are resident populations that stay in the area. Um, part of our, our monitoring projects, um, as Roman said, we, we look at presence and absence, um, but we've got um, scope to extend that out into population densities and really have a look at whether we have the same koalas um, breeding and, and bringing up young koalas um, into the future. Um, so look, overall, I'm, I can't answer that accurately, but it does appear to be a stable population at the moment. Um, I've, I've got to temper that again by saying, look, it, it's probably only 10 or 20 years worth of data. So we, as we're working on these conservation strategies, we also need more data to really target what, what's required. Excellent, awesome. Um, and now Des, there we had some questions about weeds, um, which you then covered, um, and also about cattle and, and the effect that they have on koalas, and also seasonal conditions. So they were all questions that came in that, um, that were, were subsequently then covered. But I did think that there could be a little bit more uh, elaboration on the weeds in terms of prickly pear, Raman, and your experience with that. Yeah, I was going to mention, I think really all weeds are not equal in terms of koala. Some of them, you know, we still haven't proven whether they help by protecting koalas. They move to the ground like lantana. I've seen, you know, tunnel across lantana that potentially are not detrimental to koala. But prickly pear and all those um, nasties that basically they collect um, as they move on the ground. Um, we had reports from local uh, wildlife preschool group that they were seeing quite a few of those animals and um, obviously a, a horrendous um, situation uh, for the koala itself. So, yeah, I think that that can really be, um, you know, a nasty hidden threat that uh, we might not find many of those because, you know, that happens quietly um, out, out of sight. Excellent. Awesome. We've just had a question come in, uh, which is open to either of you. Is the case that young eucalypts is it the case that young eucalypts can be poisonous to koalas? I don't think so. <laughs> have you have you ever um, got data on that yet? Um, look, I think it's um, it's a great question. Um, as I think Raman, you touched on, um, each population of koalas has um, a, a certain um, gut biome that is practice to the toxicity of certain species of eucalypts. So they do prefer some trees and won't feed on others. In our local area, we, we find some definite barriers between uh, stringy barks and box gum woodlands. They're, they're not the same species of eucalypts and koalas won't feed. One population or one family of koalas will not transition between one um, vegetation group to the other. Um, I don't know how toxic it might be, other than like any species, a koala is pretty in tune with what it likes. So if it if it identifies with um, one preferred species of eucalypt, it's probably unlikely to feed on that other species, and and therefore may not have a, a toxic effect. At the same time, it may go hungry if um, it hasn't got access to um, stringy bark, for example, if it's tuned into to stringy bark and the um, different toxins within those leaves. Excellent. Thanks for that, Dev. Um, we've got a few here. Oh, which ones to choose from? Um, do koalas, or can they, move or migrate during times of drought? And if you could elaborate on that, if they do move, where do they move from? Um, and or do they concentrate in areas? From um, survey that have been done, so there's not a, a lot of data, but there's there's a couple of uh, survey that I'm, I'll, I'll quote as an example. One was looking at koala um, during heat wave, and the one that survived were the one along creek line, but they didn't necessarily move from outside. It was more if they were there, they were in a better position to survive. And another one was following translocation. Um, they look at koala behavior and especially as the habitat was degrading whether koala were moving away from that degraded habitat or staying and they say 
in both cases, when they're translocated or when the habitat is degrading, it's um, they see all sort of um, behavior and they wonder whether it's part of you know the genetic makeup of those koala or personality some people um, call it um, that some animals are very um, much uh, inclined to stay where they are without um, without that um, boldness to explore other habitat whereas others are less um, you know attached um, but yeah in terms of big migration um, yeah, we, we wouldn't see that, but in terms of small adaptation, whether they would be able to select the best habitat, I think, um, it, it, you know, it depends on the koala. That's if you want to add to that. You're on mute, I think. Possibly? We, we can't hear you. We've lost you. <laughs> the sound was working so well. <laughs> Never trust the sound. How's that? Oh yeah, that's great. That's perfect. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think that was well answered, uh, Ramon. And again, I, I just um, we'll go back to that point. We we do know that there are definite barriers uh, for koala movement within the landscape, whether they're physical barriers uh, in lack of uh, habitat to move across. Um, there's a very famous picture of a koala in the middle of the Liverpool Plains in a horrible drought back in um, 29, uh, 2009 um, during a heat wave that was identified um, up a, a telegraph pole. Um, so obviously you get those um, barriers to, to koala movements. Um, the other one, as we discussed, might be preferred tree species. Um, so the, there are areas in the landscape that will stop koalas moving. However, they will try and move when they run out of preferred feed trees or they, they need to cool themselves because of a, a heat wave uh, or they need to find water. They, they're quite um, um, mobile. Um, and we do have data that um, track koalas in the local area that was done by Stringy Bark Ecology. And uh, I think it pointed to somewhere in the, the range of up to 40 kilometres for a male. So is that right, Ramon? I, yeah, I that... yeah, that's totally, that's doable. That's that's um, in the higher range. Um, but as I say, koala move very differently in different parts of the landscape. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I also have another question here. And just while you're answering that, I will go and quickly turn off our alarm system, which has currently gone off. Um, how common is a white koala? Not very common. <laughs> I, I still haven't seen that picture, but I haven't seen them yet. Have you seen them there? Never a white one, no. <laughs> I actually heard someone earlier today tell me about the albino koala, um, and they are up in the northeast um, of Tenterfield, which is where we're going to do our surveys, and that's the perfect segue to um, ask Roman and get her to talk about a little bit about why we're doing the surveys up there. Yeah, so we kind of um, doing two things this year. Um, we doing some um, koala scat survey using the detection dog, and that's um, to fill in some uh, gaps in area that we haven't yet covered. Um, we've 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 been working hard, but uh, it is a big area to cover. So we still have. Um, you know, spots um, that, that we would like to access. And um, we've been, um, you know, kind of uh, surveying further and further from the easy <laughs> track as well. So uh, we'll go more into National Park uh, this year. And the second thing that we're going to do is to identify places, and Des was mentioning that too, um, to start uh, gaining um, data on density of koala. So it's pretty those two things combined, the distribution of your koala, where they do occur, and then in area where they occur, how many are there? So the density of quota, and um, that's that's giving you your baseline uh, to be able to answer questions such as we have before. You know, are they surviving? Um, are they transitioning to adulthood? And and um, the way to do that is really to look at density um, along the year, and um, and so we deploying the drone uh, to do that. So that uh, should be happening later this year. Awesome, excellent. Yes, I remember uh, Des mentioning that a lot of how um, koalas are mapped is, is whether they're logged as present or absence. And 
and there's not many people up in that area, so I'm hoping to find some uh, koalas because without people, they won't get logged. Um, now, I actually, Karen, who uh, asked about the white koala, she said, my neighbour in the Liston area spotted a white koala a few months ago uh, going into my property, and she'll keep looking for it. That's awesome. So maybe, yeah, maybe it's the same one. Um, we'll have time for maybe one more question, and then, uh, and then we'll disperse and enjoy the rest of our evenings as well, or we'll continue enjoying. Um, Let's see what we have. Um, Peter Parnell, how can we find out more information on preferred trees in our area? So, um, yeah. yeah right. Sorry, Roman. No, no, I was just single. <laughs> Thank you. I, I can forward a, a list that I, I think was uh, displayed tonight, uh, in part at least, that has for our area, um, highly significant, preferred, and um, good enough, to, to use a better term, uh, good enough habitat. Um, so you can match the species of tree um, to whether koalas are likely to favour those uh, eucalypts um, in and around um, at least Armadale. Excellent. Awesome. And sorry, there is one more question before I'll, I'll do the sign off. Um, uh, have you guys ever seen birds having any impact on koalas, aggressive birds? Yeah, I did actually. Um, so that was um, one of the koala um, helping in, in terms of wildlife rescue. And one of the koala um, that I had to attend to was a young male and he had been pushed out of tree. Uh, people were watching him by calls and he fell and, and died. Um, uh, yeah, I've seen different species and sometimes, yeah, they're really, whether they're worried about a koala being in a tree with their nest or something, but they can be really aggressive and actually push them out of the tree. Yeah, I've, I've, I've found the same. It, it may not extend to you know, a general rule across species, but often birds and koalas will come into conflict. Whether that's um, just because uh, failure to recognise the other species or perceive a threat. Um, and again, that goes for cattle as well. It's not that they um, hate koalas per se, but they don't understand what that a koala is doing on the ground. Um, and often they'll, the instinct will, will kick in and, and they will uh, attack a koala or try and move it on. Um, and if you can imagine, you know, 600 kilos versus 10 kilo, kilos, it's um, not, not going to be a good outcome for the koala. So in a species, it's a funny area and, and uh, it does seem like the koala does get the, the raw end of the deal a lot of the time. Um, cockatoos, for example, do come into conflict with them. So sulfur crested cockatoos in our area. So yeah, I, I can't explain why, whether it's perceived or real. Roman, yes. if you... Do you, do you have any information on that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm the same as you. Um, yeah, I, I think it's probably a perceived threat. I don't think they necessarily, you know, um, pose any danger, but um, they can definitely, um, yeah, get the, unfortunately, the the constant attack by birds. And, and for cattle, I think, um, in other parts um, of the world, um, cattle had, have been found to trample um, animals that um, carry disease that they're affected by. So potentially there is a little bit of a, you know, selection pressure there. But yeah, um, it's it's really not well studied, that's for sure. Yep. Excellent. Awesome. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Roman and Des. Um, if anyone who's watching wants to know more, there's a survey that will pop up after this webinar ends uh, where you can log any extra questions um, or interest for any events coming up. Uh, there'll also be an email coming out tomorrow which has my contact details, so feel free to give me an email even if you just want to have a chat on the phone. Excellent. Awesome. I'm happy to include that um, preferred species list too to, to anybody that's interested, so you might wrap that up in the um, in the summary as well. Yes, excellent, awesome. I might, I'll even um, 
uh, is it okay? I'll add your email to that so they can yeah, no get problem. into it. Yep. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See ya. And now to figure out how to turn it off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether we were catching up after, but I suppose I'll, 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 we I'll, can I'll. catch up tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Okay, Whatever excellent. Sounds, sounds good. All right. <laughs> Have a good evening. See ya. Bye. You too. Bye. Mm -hmm.